Hello everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Oscar Svirton and uh, I am the CEO and founder of FOSID. FOSID is an open source compliance company. We're based in Sweden. And I'm going to talk today about the uh, benefits of using artificial intelligence in open source compliance. Uh, agenda, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, open source auditing basically two phases, the scan phase and then analysis phase, uh, how it's done, basically how we do it when we do, do maybe uh, merge and acquisition audits or when we've done it when we're using our own tools with customers. Uh, and then the auditor's decision-making process, the analysis. Uh, a few things about lesson learned and uh, artificial intelligence. So, introduction to open source auditing. I guess you, many of you have done this, but it's basically about finding uh, what open source you're using in your, in your products. And it could be entire components, it could be files uh, that you're using, or just snippets of code or modified, modified uh, files. And the whole process is basically from you have a software deliverable and you generate an uh, open source inventory uh, out of a software deliverable and have an inventory bill of material for that open source in the end. Uh, the process consists of basically, we sometimes describe it as two stages, the scan, which is uh, a machine, a computer does, basically scans, compares what you have to a large knowledge base. Uh, in this case, the size of the knowledge base is very important because if you, there's somewhere around probably 100 million open source projects out there. If you have them in your knowledge base, then you find it. If you don't, you don't find it. And then, of course, accuracy of the results and scan speed. These things are done continuously our customers are integrating this kind of scans into the continuous integration so it needs to go fast. And then the analysis its really the phase that takes most of the time and it depends the quality of your results, it depends on the quality of the results from your tool but also knowledge of your auditor and how easy it is to use these tools. So if you take the scan uh, in theory, it's fairly simple. Uh, you have a code base, you scan it, and you get a number of components, you get a, a number of files, maybe some snippets. Uh, but in reality, it can be a little bit more complex. First of all, uh, it's not just few files. I think 2018, most of the audits that we've done for our customers in merge and acquisitions and this kind of situations, They've consisted of at least around 50,000 files. So there's a lot of software that we scan. And just the Linux kernel is somewhere around 40,000 files. So first of all, it's a lot of files that you need to, to scan. And then when you find components, it's not always obvious where they come from. Uh, if you take a component like Zlib 1.2.7, in our knowledge base, we have somewhere around two and a half thousand matches to that component. And we need to pinpoint which is actually the correct match. Somewhere around 900 of those are uh, forks or clones. Uh, so that adds to complexity. And of course, uh, those components often include other components inside, libraries. Uh, and then there are snippets of code. You find the snippets both in the uh, components that you identified by, but also in the proprietary code that you have. There may be snippets of code there. So it all becomes much more complex there. And then you add to this fault positives. Some of the files you get matches that probably are irrelevant. And then uh, all the licenses. And Although, the, I mean, there are somewhere around three, 300 declared licenses, 
But if you, for example, in our knowledge base, if you look at the number of unique licenses, we have some around 300,000 different unique licenses in our knowledge base. Uh, so they correspond to the, to the licenses that you identify, but there's a lot of different var variants of those. And some around 109 million uh, source code files that have a license dec declaration. So basically, this is uh, the audit process. And to add to complexity, when we do this, we actually don't see the source code. We only look at the, the hashes, the uh, digital signatures of the source code. So we don't actually compare with the origin when we do, for example, merger and acquisitions. This is something that many of our customers, especially, especially the target companies that are being acquired, uh, like with our process, because they don't they don't like showing their source code to someone who is paid by the potential buyer. Uh, and then when the scan is done, it's actually uh, when the decision making process starts, an analysis by, by uh, an auditor. And uh, we like to kind of uh, put those decisions that the auditor makes into five categories. Uh, the first one, uh, to determine the code origin. Uh, and then to analyze validity of the matches, especially partial fine, fine matches. Inspect license declaration and also license text. Uh, and then in some cases, uh, run external investigations. And these last in external investigations, it gets uh, more and more seldom that we need to do it, but still there are cases when we need to do it. But as I said, to, to determine uh, the origin of the code, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Here uh, you have a file that I already mentioned, is at lib 1.2.7, and as I mentioned, it's somewhere around two and a half thousand matches in the community for this file, this particular file. Uh, but here it's relatively easy. It's in the header. Uh, it specifies what file it is, what, what is the origin. So in this case, it's relatively straightforward for a scanner to just find the origin. It's not always this easy, but sometimes it is. Uh, and then to analyze validity of the partial matches, uh, if you look at this file here, we actually, we actually took a proprietary file and we put a Linux function into this file. Uh, so what we do here on the left-hand side is our proprietary, proprietary file with the function included in it, Linux function, and then the community file on the right-hand side. And you, if you look at those side by side, you see these are actually uh, there has been a function copied into your proprietary file. You can see that you see it's a valid function. You, you understand you need to do it something about it, or it may or may not be, pro be a problem. It depends on your policies within the company and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a GPL file from, from the Linux kernel. But in some cases, it's uh, the snippet of code that you find may not be relevant, and one such a uh, case could be an import statement uh, in Java. That, I mean, this is not something you would have copyright for. So you just, so what the scanner needs to do here is need to determine this file is not relevant. You need to discard it. Uh, so initially we highlighted these files, but now we have means uh, with AI to actually discard this kind of uh, uh, matches, so we just don't show those. Uh, and then uh, the next thing is to actually inspect license declarations. And as with the other cases, in, there are cases when this is very simple. Uh, here, Node.js, uh, it is an uh, MIT component. And in this specific file that belongs to Node.js, it's actually another license, but it's also here declared in the, in the license header. It's a Mozilla public license. Uh, so this is relatively straightforward. Uh, the scanner will 
find it and will determine uh, correctly uh, what it is. But it's not always that easy because for a scanner, if you have a license declaration like this one, it actually doesn't say which license it is, but rather which license it is not. Here specifically it says uh, this is not an MIT. Uh, <laughs> this is not a GPL v3 file. It specifically says that this is a public domain file, uh, an unlicensed, so uh, it's more difficult for a scanner to actually determine what this is. Uh, so here you need to engage, employ some AI technologies to actually identify this file correctly. Uh, and the same thing can happen with uh, uh, license texts. Uh, if you have a, a component, you have often a file which is called a license or copying where the information about the file is. Uh, included and in this case you have the information it's a ghost script and it's licensed on the GPL v2 it's specified there so so as soon as the scanner finds this information it can mark the this file as GPL GPL file this is relatively easy uh, and this is another case it's actually not so easy if uh, an auditor looks at this one he sees a license header, it's Apache license. It's Apache license V2. Uh, it comes from a project at GitHub, Pocket Warriors. And you can actually, you probably would consider this as an Apache file, which it is actually not. Because if you look at the uh, GitHub repo for this one, you actually will find that there were some uh, additions and deletions from the license. And so basically here is a screenshot from our tool where you see that some words have been replaced instead of you may. You now, the license now say, says you cannot reproduce and distribute copies of this software. Uh, and there change some more of the license text and even add a section Section 10, which specifically says usage of these files are allowed by uh, the legal owner under these terms. You do not edit them under any circumstances. You only use these files for PocketMine API website, pocketmine.net. So this is actually no longer, it's certainly not Apache. It's not even open source. And an auditor who would see this file, who would see uh, that license initially, it probably doesn't, wouldn't discover it unless you run some kind of investigation here. And uh, the last part is another difficulty. There are corner cases where uh, here you have a file, an example. You identify this file as uh, load loading image view uh, an MIT license and it all looks good but actually if you look into this file you find that there are snippets of code in this file from uh, uh, from Stack Overflow specifically there is uh, if you go to the Stack Overflow and look at, at the description there's a problem in that Stack Overflow and Stack Overflow, I guess most of you know, it's a website where you can find solutions to your programming problems. Uh, and there is a, there's an article about how, how to get the position of a picture inside an image view. And there is some code associated to it, and that code has been copied into that component. So uh, coming from uh, Stack Overflow, it's not MIT license. It's the license that is used for the contribute, uh, contributed code to Stack Overflow, which is a, a weak copyleft license, basically. So the whole component is no longer MIT. Uh, so this is kind of uh, some of the problems that you face. And 
if we, we think about the lessons, lessons learned, uh, I think most of the problems you face when you audit, when you, when you scan the code, are actually pretty, uh, pretty simple. But there are, uh, the important thing is that the complexity of auditing increasing. We reuse more and more code. We put code from one project into another project. We mix licenses. So actually, all this affects, affects the, the complexity. I think GitHub, we found out that on GitHub, there is one new project added on GitHub in a second. And uh, of course, most of those are forks. But they're actually real, real projects. And reusing this and mixing is it's actually increasing complexity uh, quite a lot. And as I said, I think today there's like some already 100 million projects in the open source. But the vast majority of the decision is actually simple and monotonous. Uh, and, uh, but then when you review something simple and monotonous, and then, then at some point you get a corner case, like the one with Apache, you, you actually quite easily miss that, because it's just we are not that good at finding uh, when someone replaced may with cannot. Uh, it's not what humans are good at. And uh, of course, this other part with auditing is the most uh, time consuming and uh, costly part of the whole compliance process, uh, license compliance process. Uh, that's where you have all the people that work with it. We've talked to some of our customers, they have upwards 100 people working with compliance. It's, it's a 400,000 people company, but uh, still 100 people working with compliance, and most of them are working with this audit, uh, audit work. So actually adding AI and solving some of those problems in more automatic, automated way is the only way to go uh, to improve compliance. And the thing that we are doing, we're using two kind of two ways of do this: expert systems and machine learning. And expert systems are basically rules that we describe. So, recurring problems are can be described in this way. Uh, it's usually faster than machine learning, uh, but at the same time, if you have corner cases, you need other means to do this. You need uh, basically uh, learning data and you need to teach your algorithm how to make the decisions, the correct decisions. So just a kind of overview uh, today when we uh, in our tools we have uh, knowledge base on top of this we have something we call scan engine and there we have uh, software that we call Alfred, which determines the code origin and analyzes the validity of the partial fire matches. And then we have, in up in the command line interface, we have uh, Shinobi, yeah, uh, which inspects license declaration and uh, uh, license texts. These are kind of the, where we use some of the intelligence that we have in our, yeah, our okay. systems. So this was this really on. my 25 minutes. Any questions? Thank you.